The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Dean Smith, which is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. People will recall the famous novel by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. But if Charles Dickens was alive today, he would be compelled to write about a tale of two Labor parties. The first Labor Party is the Labor Party that acts in a certain way when it's desperate to get elected to government. The other tale of the Labor Party is how it chooses to act when it is elected to government. Earlier today, we talked about the great deceit that Labor has inflicted upon West Australian voters. Prior to the election, the Labor Party said that large-scale, wide-ranging, backward-looking industrial relations reforms were not part of its plan. And today, six months after their election, as we begin the last parliamentary fortnight, the big ticket item that this Senate chamber will debate will be Labor's big plans for industrial relations reform. But nothing tells the story better about what Labor says and what Labor does on its way into government compared to what Labor says and does when it's in government than the issue of electricity prices. 97, just think about that, three less than 100, nine, seven, 97 occasions the Labor Party thought it would seek to camouflage its poor record on electricity prices in an effort to come to government. Jim Chalmers, Order. then opposition treasurer, Smith. Mr Jim Chalmers, then opposition treasurer, said in Perth on the 30th of April this year, we've got policies about getting power bills down. We've got policies for cheaper, more accessible health care, which is a big part of the story. We've got policies to make childcare cheap, to get real wages moving again. Policies to get electricity prices down, Mr Chalmers said. The Prime Minister himself said at the Powering Australian press conference on the 3rd of December in 2021, the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, then the shadow opposition leader, said it will see electricity prices fall from the current level by $275 for households by 2025. In his National Press Club address on the 18th of May this year, then opposition leader, now Labor Prime Minister, Mr Albanese says, making Australia a renewable energy superpower is the fastest way to cut pollution and the most effective way to act on climate change. And then he says, but it is also the best way to cut power bills for families and businesses, saving families $275 a year. They are just a few examples of the 97 occasions when Labor in opposition said it would commit to bringing power prices down for Australian families by $275. That's what they said in opposition. And what has happened in government? What has happened in government? You can run, but you can't hide from the budget process. You can run, but you can't hide from the budget process. And in the government's own budget documents, at page 57, in the first budget document, it said this, Treasury has assumed that retail electricity prices will increase by an average of 20 per cent nationally in late 2022, contributing to higher forecast CPI in 2022-23. Giving forward wholesale contract prices for electricity remain elevated, retail electricity prices are expected to rise by a further 
30 per cent in 2023-24. What Labor says in opposition trying to get to government is very, very different to what it does in government. And who are the people that pay the price for that? Ordinary Australian families, small and medium-sized businesses. And just this morning, West Australians would have woken up to a news story about how West Australian charities are now having to do more to support Australian families, West Australian families, meet Order. the rising cost of Your living, time living has challenges. Expired. Senator Sheldon. Yeah, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, again, the question of cost of living, and let's, let's look at what the impact is for so many people right at the moment. At the inquiry into the most recent um, industrial relations bill, Peter Richards, a Simplot worker from Devonport, 42 years old, casual forklift driver. To his credit, he served in East Timor with the Army back in 1999-2000. And Peter went on to say that the cost of living has gone through the roof. Everyday necessities. It's the difference between buying frozen vegetables or having fresh vegetables. I currently walk most places because the cost of fuel has gone through the roof. And I get a lift to and from work from my fellow workmates. Paul Jeffries, again talking about the cost of living and the pressures in, to be a, being a working person uh, in Australia at the moment, under the previous government's legislation. I work at CUB Carlton United Breweries here in Melbourne as a shift electrician. I've been there 30 years. He was told by a company by the name of Catalyst, who was operating as a recruitment arm of Programmed, that his wages and conditions he had one choice. One, he got sacked, and secondly, he was told he had to take an agreement for a 65 per cent wage decrease if he wanted to work. And he said, when your wages and conditions are reduced by 65 per cent, your whole life changes, your world crumbles, you just fall apart, just like that. He went on to say about the pressures that are on him and his workers and have to Always, almost a year of fighting to get their wages and conditions back on keel. They eventually got there, with no help from the legislation. And he went on to say this can absolutely still happen to thousands of workers right across Australia. Heather McCarty, a primary school teacher, talking about the problems that she's had of 18 months of negotiations in, uh, in the existing multi-employer stream and not having the capacity to bring those, that uh, dispute to a head and the effects on her and her colleagues. We need the negotiations, she said, to process to hurry up. It's too slow. It's far too slow. We have no power. The legislation is a way to change things and make things better for employees. And of course, then we go to the academics and these reports, the reports that have been uh, talked about multi-employer bargaining. And it really is a question about whether the race to the bottom, which has happened for the last 10 years, or we want to have a race to the top based on quality economic output. Because that's what happens when you start making the system work for working people, for fellow Australians in this country. Now, improving employment and wage distribution in the 2019 OECD report says multi-employer bargaining is critical. It's higher, higher employment, lower unemployment, a better integration of vulnerable groups and less wage inequality, addressing gender inequality. A 2020 OECD report found that multi-employer arrangements are necessary to negotiate targeted raises in female-dominated and low-paid sectors. And of course, macroeconomic performance in other countries such as Austria, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Japan. Multi-employer bargaining is an essential part of the macroeconomic policy. It gives the capacity for skills and training and investment. It's where people come together and work at how we can work results together. And they come together across industries. What a great idea. They can turn around and say, we as a group can actually invest in skills, training and capacity across our industry. And even more so, they also get smaller employers, medium-sized employers who come together, who may not have the resources to do it on their own. And we heard through the recent Senate inquiry, 
when numerous examples were given from small employers and medium-sized employers about how it works for them, how it would work for them. But then, of course, you've got the vanguard of people like you know, Alan Joyce and his you know, material world, where he says you know, 21 external companies, 17 own subsidiaries are all OK. They can, they, that's OK. Wages go down. That's not multi-employer bargaining when I set up dodgy companies. Or well, then you have the Perla, where we got you know, the, right, the, really the home goal. You know, when the Senator Birmingham says, those are the things that our government managed to achieve with strong economic growth in our last year in office, with unemployment down 50-year lows, creating the conditions for economic growth to help drive help to drive product, productive Order. wages your growth. Time has well, that is a lie. Resume your seat, Senator Rice. I rise to speak on this matter of public importance on the government's broken promise to bring cost of living relief in the budget. Energy bills are rising, rents are rising, the cost of food is rising. We are in a cost of living crisis. And it seems everything is rising except for income support payments. These are still way below the poverty line, with job seeker at just $48 a day. It is people on income support who are most impacted by the cost of living crisis, who need cost of living relief, who have been failed by this government in the budget. On $48 a day, how does the government expect people to pay the bills, to pay the rent, to feed themselves? The reality is people just can't, and they aren't. Last week I had the privilege of visiting St Mary's House of Welcome in Collingwood in Melbourne, a community hub where anyone is welcome to come for lunch, for a shower or to charge their phone. And what I saw is that the, fa the face of homelessness is changing. St Mary's is seeing more people than ever before, including young people and families. Many come to grab a meal to take home to their family because they simply cannot afford fresh fruit and vegetables anymore. I mean, the work that St Mary's does is incredible, but they rely on donations and they run on the smell of an oily rag. And with the cost of living rising, they are feeling the pressure from increased demand. And the reality is we should not be relying on organisations like St Mary's to do the heavy lifting and to be supporting our community. Inadequate Inadequate income support payments force people to live in poverty. But poverty is a political choice, and it's a choice that this government is making that made in the budget. We can blame the cost of living crisis all we want, but the government has the power, and they have made a choice. That what their choice needs to be is to acknowledge that as cost of living continues to rise, income support payments, they need to rise too. We need a guaranteed livable income of at least $88 a day for all income support payments. We need to end mutual obligations which do nothing to help people find work. And we need to remove unfair restrictions on who can access payments to ensure that everybody has got enough to cover their basic needs. Only with a guaranteed adequate income will we really tackle the cost of living crisis for those who are feeling it the most. Will we see income equality so that places like St Mary's aren't expected to keep on picking up the pieces? Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Brockman. Madam Acting Deputy President, I too rise to uh, speak on this matter of public importance uh, from Senator Smith on the cost of living crisis facing so many Australians. This is a government that doesn't have a plan, and that's very, very clear. In fact, we've seen it revealed here in question time today, and I'll, I'll go back to that later. But we've seen a government with no plan. They, this government, incoming, knew that gas prices were on the rise. We've seen that long before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. We'd seen rising gas prices. And we knew that in the end that they would have a flow-on impact on businesses and households. And what's this government's immediate response to that crisis in gas prices, which is an eastern state's gas crisis, I will just point out. The West Australian uh, situation is very different. But what's the government's response? What does it put on the table as 
policy responses to the rising cost of gas impacting on the rising cost of living? Price controls? A policy that has failed every time it has been tried for over 2,000 years? Price controls? Increased regulation? A policy that, again, uh, has a very dubious chance of actually succeeding in pushing downward prices on gas. Uh, and what's the other one they floated? Taxation increase? Taxation increase is really going to help cost of living pressures on Australian families and Australian businesses? A tax increase? I mean, it almost beggars belief. But this is a government that came into office without a plan. And as I said, we've seen that today. Uh, in answering a question on inflation and wages today, the finance minister said, and I quote, no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. Now think about that for a second. No one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. She said that just today. Yet what did her Prime Minister say just a few short months ago, in fact in 2022, about wages and inflation? He said, and I quote, it's not bad luck, it's bad policy that wages aren't keeping up with inflation. Now don't you see quite a contrary position in those two statements? The Prime Minister. It's not bad luck. It's bad policy that wages aren't keeping up with inflation. The finance minister. No one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. This is a government that has no clue about how to handle the pressures of a modern economy. This is a government that has no clue on how to satisfy the demands of the union movement on the one hand and still maintain uh, downward pressure on prices, maintain a strong and growing economy that they inherited from the Liberal government. It is a government that promises much. They promise $275 decrease in power prices to every Australian family—$275. In their first budget, they delivered an increased outlook for energy prices going into the foreseeable future, an increased cost of energy into the foreseeable future. We've seen massive rises in the cost of fuel, which impacts on every Australian household. We've seen massive rises in the cost of rental accommodation. We've seen huge flow-on impacts to things like grocery prices. And every, every family knows that the, uh, the, the headline rate of inflation is not reflective of the real cost of living pressures that are facing every Australian family. And part of the reason why these cost of living pressures will keep going is because this is a government that is contradictory internally. It doesn't know how to handle this situation and it doesn't even understand how wages and inflation work. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Green. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to stand here today in the Senate and uh, contribute to this matter of public importance debate on the cost of living. And that's because as we head into the final sitting week of this year, the Albanese Labor government isn't slowing down on delivering our election commitments. Over the next fortnight, we will be implementing our $7.5 billion five-point cost of living plan. We will be delivering cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, more generous paid parental leave, more affordable housing, and we will get ma wages moving again. In just six short months, the Albanese Labor government has taken more action on the cost of living than the previous government did in almost a decade. Just in the chamber today, we are talking about cheaper childcare. This is just one of those steps that we are taking. These changes will be material impacts for around 96 per cent of families who use early childhood education. Labor's plan for cheaper childcare will make it more affordable for around 1.26 million Australian families. 
But it's not just cheaper childcare that we are delivering. Our cost of living plan won't just reduce those costs. It will also put Australians back on track for real pay rises. And that's because our secure jobs and better pay bill goes right to the heart of cost of living challenges Australians are facing right now. Australia's current workplace laws are not working to deliver meaningful wage increases, and no one forgets that under the previous government, under those opposite, it was a deliberate design feature to keep wages low. See, the hypocrisy for those opposite to come in here and talk about cost of living, while at the same time having a design feature to keep wages low is not lost on everyday Australians. And it, the hypocrisy continues when it comes to the discussion around electricity prices in this place. Because can I tell you, the former government had 22 energy policies, 22 energy policies over nine years and those incoherent, inconsistent, uncertain policies led to three changes in the Liberal leadership, possibly two in the National Party, uh, to direct results of disunity and energy on policy. They couldn't get their act together for 10 years, and now they want to come in here and lecture us. This is their record on electricity prices. Complete disunity on net zero. Vetoing renewable energy projects, which would have created jobs, which is the most affordable energy source in the market. Look, they promised to build a coal-fired power station in North Queensland, but of course that was just a press release. They never actually did that. They hid key information about electricity prices from the Australian public about the rises in electricity. This is not only a problem of the former government. It's followed them through to opposition, because we know that the opposition still has climate deniers in their ranks, politicians that come into this place with their graphs downloaded from some pokey part of the internet. Now their answer, uh, after having no solutions for a decade, seems to be to offer nuclear power as a solution. Well, last week in estimates, the CSIRO said only weeks ago that nuclear wasn't a competitive option and that it would take until the next decade to get up and running. This is the solution from those opposite, the most expensive form of power that will take us into the next decade to establish. We know that renewable energy is the cheapest form of power. That is why we are delivering our Powering Australia plan. And we know that this country needs certainty when it comes to energy uh, policies. That is why we are delivering our plan for Australians. What you will see from those opposite is hypocrisy when it comes to energy prices and cost of living. Now, I appreciate I'm about to be followed in this place by um, the Venn diagram of, um, <laughs> of conspiracy theorists about climate change and throw in anti-vax as well. But I just want to make this clear. When it comes to the uh, facts on order, energy Senator policy— Green, order, Senator Green. Uh, Senator Scar, on a point of order. Uh, my point of order is personal reflection. Uh, there were two personal reflections there on my good colleague, Senator um, uh, well, it could be either Senator Roberts or Senator Rennie, um, in relation to um, assertions of conspiracy theorists and, uh, and any vaxxer, and I think they should be withdrawn. If you don't know, really call it personal, can you? <laughs> um, Senator Green, perhaps you could clarify that you aren't intending on making a reflection in your contribution. Um, but I will draw you to the point of order from Senator Scar and ask that you take note of uh, the point that he made. I'm happy to paint the entire bench over there with the same brush. With the same brush when it comes order, to <laughs> Senator Green, Senator Scar, another point of order. Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, I think uh, the advice and previous rulings are that a personal reflection, which is uh, done in group form on a collective basis can perhaps be even more egregious can be even more egregious than if it's just directed at a particular senate senator and I can certainly remember the clerk providing advice um, with respect to uh, that sort of collective um, reference um.
Um, Senator Green, you have 36 seconds left of your contribution, um, and I might just ask that you exercise a degree of caution in how uh, widely or narrowly you choose to make reflections on senators opposite. Um, I do note that you were um, choosing your words quite um, carefully, I thought, but just be very cautious of not uh, too broadly uh, using the brush that you were utilising at that point. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, thank you. And I do think it is important that the Senate understands I'm talking directly about the former government, the Liberal National Party, and their failure over a decade over a decade to develop any energy policy. And we know the reason that that occurred, because of their disunity, because of the beliefs in their own party about this, about climate change and about delivering cheaper energy policy. So we will not stand here as many points of order as you want to call. We won't be lectured by those opposite about bringing down energy prices because they never did it over a decade. Order. Thank you, Senator Green. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. The Albanese government's behaviour goes well beyond a broken election promise to give cost of living relief. The government is actively making inflation worse. The inflation rate is 8 per cent and will remain at 8 per cent into the future on the back of increases to energy prices. Electricity, gas, diesel and petrol are all inputs into every corner of our economy. Forcing energy price increases to appease the sky god of warming will force up input costs right across our economy and lead to more inflation. Weather-dependent solar and wind power will never provide baseload power. Doubling down on more solar and wind before the added cost of changing out every wind turbine and solar panels with new ones before we even get to 2050 will lead to more inflation. Taxpayers pay for these things twice, once in taxpayer subsidies to wind and solar and through higher inflation, energy inflation. Not only do we have a lack of wage rises, we have a lack of wages. Businesses are closing all over Australia as inflation wreaks havoc in the productive economy and energy costs drive manufacturing overseas. This government has no answers. We have just seen a childcare bill that gives handouts to millionaires but fails to create a single job. Failing to use government policy to create jobs while allowing 220,000 new migrants into Australia every year will create a pool of unemployed resulting in reduced market power for labour. That can only mean lower wages, even before losing 8 per cent a year off their pay packet through inflation. One Nation believe the way to break the inflation cycle is a comprehensive root and branch review of the taxation system to return bracket creep to wage earners while forcing big business, especially foreign multinationals, to pay their fair share. Queensland Labor government's health department still mandates COVID injections for health professionals. Injection mandates must be abolished now. Let anyone who wants to work, work. We are one community, we are one nation, and Labor is a threat to breadwinner jobs. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, rise about this, bill today, uh, this uh, motion today about uh, the Albanese government's inability to control the price of energy. Uh, it's not really surprising uh, that that has happened, and as we heard from the speech before, uh, it was basically made up more of invective and personal uh, insults than any actual detail. And we saw that type of behaviour as well in estimates, where I uh, got to question uh, Senator McAllister about how many transmission lines that we were going to need uh, in order to meet the 43 per cent reduction in uh, carbon dioxide by 2030, and of course she actually had no idea. The numbers we were given were somewhere between 5,000 uh, kilometres and 28,000 kilometres. Now, there was an article uh, a year or two ago in the Australian Financial Review that uh, said that the cost of building, uh, what was it, 900 kilometres of a transmission line would cost $2.4 billion. That was back in 2020. So if you wanted to build 28,000 uh, kilometres of transmission lines, that would cost a cool little $75 billion back in uh, 2020 prices. So I suspect that's probably closer to $100 billion uh, just to build the transmission lines. So if you think energy prices have gone up a lot already, um, get ready, get set for them to go even higher, because that's what will happen under the Albanese government, who have absolutely no idea on the price of basically turning uh, the, the energy grid into being backed by 82 per cent of renewable energy. And I'm glad Senator Green referred to the CSIRO because I've spoken to the CSIRO many times 
uh, and they have actually said that there's 40 different models to get to net zero. Can you believe that? 40 different models. Now, these people want you to believe that the science is settled, but there's 40 different models, apparently, to work out how to get to net zero. Now, let me tell you something. If you've got to rely on a model to get to net zero, that's not science. That's indoctrination, intimidation and shoddy mathematical modelling. Okay? The only time the science is settled is when you've got an algorithm demonstrating cause and effect and quantifying that cause and effect. Einstein wasn't famous because he was a scientist. He was famous because of the algorithms he invented, e equals mc squared. It's called mathematics. It's called mathematics, and that's what matters. So let, let's go uh, back to the economy, however, and uh, another question I put to the CSIRO, uh, another question I put to the CSIRO was that the cost of recycling the battery, or actually, I didn't actually ask this, uh, uh, Larry Marshall, the head of the CSIRO, actually volunteered this, the cost of recycling a battery is three times more than building it. It's three times more than building it. And of course, this is the thing that the unicorn farmers don't want to talk about, is that it's not just the generation that you've got to build, it's the cost of building it, it's the generation, it's the transmission, it's the storage, it's all the extra security services, so that's more batteries on top of storage. You need more batteries to control frequency control, and then you want to recycle it. And then you re want to recycle it. Now, I'll tell you a simple solution if you want to recycle it. It's called photosynthesis. You were taught about it in grade eight science. Okay, very, very simple. And we know that carbon dioxide is recycled through the atmosphere every four years. Simple numbers. The weight of the atmosphere is 5.15 times 10 to the 15. Carbon dioxide makes 0.04 per cent of that atmosphere, which means the weight of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 2 by 10 to the power of 12. Carbon dioxide has a specific density of 1.53. So the weight of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 3 times 10 to the power of 12. Now we know, as per the IPC report 2007, that 800 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide is consumed via photosynthesis every year naturally in the environment. That's by 8 by 10 to the power of 11. So you take 3 by 10 to times the power of 12 divided by 8 by 10 to the power of 11 is 4, which means the carbon dioxide— no, 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 that's photosynthesis, champ. Photosynthesis. You taught about it in grade 8 science. And so let me tell you, we can cut the cost by basically going back and building more coal-powered fire stations Order. near my hometown at Cogan Creek. There's 400 Order. million tonnes Order, of freak— Order, Senator Rennick. Senator Scar is on his feet. Senator Scar. Uh, Order, acting, acting Deputy President, there is just a continuous, <laughs> continuous barrage of interjections from Senator Shoebridge. Andrew I'm having trouble uh, hearing my friend Senator Rennick, even though I'm this far away from Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, I was likewise struggling to hear um, above all of the cries across the chamber, but I would also um, remind all senators to direct their comments through the chair. That might enable us to be somewhat more orderly. Senator Shoebridge, are you wishing to de debate the point of order? Um, and I'm sorry, it was his attack on Einstein that really, really, really <laughs> set me off. And, and, uh, and I apologise if that troubled me in the way it did. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Senator Rennick, you can continue your contribution. Uh, thank you, Acting De Deputy President. And let me, let me say the cheapest way and the best way to lower power prices will only be under a coalition government, and we will do that by adding some more turbines at Cogan Creek near my hometown of Chinchilla, which is 400 million tonnes of free coal owned by the state government. You've only got to uh, basically mine it, put it straight into the coal mine, it goes straight into the southern end connector, and you get free energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, the time for the debate on the MPI has expired, so I will now proceed to the consideration of documents.